ninth and tenth graders don't have the ability to communicate well in front of a group. And this gives them the ability to overcome those obstacles at an earlier age. What's unique about the competition is that it is geared to ninth and tenth graders. And this is the point in their academic career in high school where they're taking global studies or modern European history. It's a fun way to learn. It's through experience. It's by doing research. It's by being actively engaged in learning. Students begin the Euro Challenge by competing regionally. It is seen as the best experience they can have at the nine and ten grades uh, to compete nationally. Teams are comprised of three to five students and are asked to give a 15-minute presentation. During the presentation, teams must answer a three-part question. First, describe the current economic situation in the Euro area. Second, illustrate one economic-related challenge using one member country of the Euro area. And third, recommend policies for addressing the challenge you identify in the country you selected. The students make this presentation in front of a panel of judges. The challenge that we had to face for our presentation was the issue of inflation in Spain. What we tell them is that they can decide the format of their presentation. The idea of the skit came around and we decided to do like a talk show. I'm playing a facilitator. Our newspaper is the format for which we will be presenting our presentation to the judges. As a team, we will be set up as an editorial board staff. I know what took this article away. Following the presentations, students face a 10-minute question and answer session with the judges. These well, the students are presenting at the Federal Reserve Bank. We should adopt it to, to be in a better position to deal with aging. Regional competitions are held at several European Union centers of excellence and Federal Reserve Banks around the country. After the preliminary regional rounds, the winners advance to the semi-final and final rounds, which are held in New York City. It was like, wow, we're in New York. It was really exciting. We're finally there. When we're conducting the Euro Challenge, we're not only preparing students for today, we're preparing students for the future. On competition day of the Euro Challenge, Students face two rounds. In the first round, all the teams make their presentations to the judges. Only four of these teams will move on to the final round. I think as judges, we were very impressed with what we saw. What I was most impressed by was the caliber of experts, uh, the judges, um, the panels that they presented to. These were professors, economists. These are diplomats, ambassadors. They take the students seriously. We get to show how much we are invested into this competition to everybody who's here. We, we worked so hard on this. It's just so nice. The Spanish need to integrate more modern technology into their economy, an area in which they're lacking. I think it's actually just a really good experience because I've really gained economic knowledge and just history of Europe knowledge, which I really didn't have before. Most adults could not discuss the European Union and the Euro as well as they did. The kids were very well rehearsed and had wonderful presentation skills. Our present I'm going to stop now, but I welcome you to go onto the Euro Challenge website, www.eurochallenge.org. There's also a pamphlet in your packages to learn more about this competition. It's my hope that everyone in this room will get excited by what they've just seen. We are expanding in the Washington, D.C. region for the first time this year. So for the first time, schools from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia are eligible to compete in the Euro Challenge. The winners, the regional winners of that competition will be flown to uh, New York or go by train to New York. We'll see how that, that goes and, and spend two nights in a New York hotel at our expense, at the expense of the program, and compete in the semifinal rounds and final rounds of the competition held in the same day, as I said, at the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. This is an exceptional experience for your students who are involved in this. It's a very intense experience. Um, it's, it's not easy. I will tell you from the onset that your um, students will be challenged. You will be challenged. That's the point of it. Um, 
But we have an incredible array of resources, as was said in the video, up on this website that help students to answer that three-part challenge question and lead them directly to the information that they need. So they're not, not sitting around in a sea um, of the internet trying to find out uh, the answers to these questions. We hone them in directly to what to the information that they need to know. And I'm not going to you know, spend a lot of time talking about this, but I, I really feel very deeply, and I've seen students and teachers who've been involved in this program, it is something that changes their lives. Um, and it's something that colleges look at and ask them about when they're in college interviews a couple of years later. Um, this looks interesting. Uh, let me, you know, find out about that. For students even who aren't going on to college, this can be the first time that they don a suit and rub shoulders with, with, with economists, with diplomats, um, go to places like our delegation or a university or the Federal Reserve Bank to present something that they've worked upon. Um, so it's substantive knowledge, but it's also an experience, a personal experience, the experience of teamwork and a team of three to five students of, of forming this presentation and working on it. Um, that is incredibly valuable. So if anyone has any questions right now that I can answer about the Euro Challenge competition, I would be grateful if you could let me know and perhaps, you know, on the sign-up sheet make an indication. I think there's a column to indicate whether you're interested at all in learning more about this program. We are partnering with the World Affairs Council and the George Washington University. We have this, these two fantastic partners to expand this program in this area, as I said, for the first time this year. We are extremely, um, as I said, excited about it. George Washington University will be holding in mid-December, I think it's December 14th, date to be confirmed next week, um, at their university, a orientation for both students and teachers. So it's a time where you bring your students as well to learn about, um, about the, um, the competition itself, how to prepare for the competition, basic economic concepts, and um, some of the information even that I'm going to be presenting to you. Um, that tries to put what's going on in Europe and its challenges, particularly this, this economic and um, financial crisis that's going on right now, into um, perspective and in basic language that can be understood um, by students. Any questions? Anybody intrigued? Okay, great, great. We hope you all will, um, will participate or think about participating at least. www.euro-challenge.org. The grade level is? Ninth and tenth. And I know that that is a stretch for some. And I know, you know, curriculum, you're coming into the program at a good time because we've been through a lot of these chinks and discussions with teachers. We've, we've involved teachers in the formation of this program and in the evolution of this program from the very beginning. And we feel quite confident that it is targeted at the right students right now. Um, if you teach, if you are a teacher of 11th and 12th graders, if you are a teacher of AP whatever, European history or something, you can work with teachers of underclass aged of 9th and 10th graders to recruit those students. And you can have sort of a partnership. We have a lot of social studies teachers or language teachers that um, are interested in Europe, but partners, say, with an economics teacher that teaches normally upperclassmen to try to um, bring the, the, the students up to, up to speed on those types of skills. We have a lot of different combinations. There's no, um, no set prescription or recipe for a Euro Challenge team. Yeah? you guys plan on expanding to 11th and 12th? If you get 9th and 10th graders wrapped up about this, what do they do? If they're interested in an economic model or a pursuit of school, what, what do you have for the 11th and 12th graders? That's a, really, that's a really good question. And you know, when, when we developed this program seven years ago, we developed it with the help of the Federal Reserve Bank, which has um, a program called the Fed Challenge. And so, I don't know if you've heard about that. It, it's, it's much more economics-oriented. Ours has a lot of, you know, politics, culture, society issues um, involved, uh, as well as the economics. But we didn't want to clash with that, and we saw it as a real um, you know, evolution so that students would learn about the Euro Challenge when they were learning about the rest of the world and starting their language uh, studies and things like that, and then they would be ready for the Fed Challenge. Unfortunately, the Fed Challenge is not offered in all of the regions that we are, and it's actually shrinking. Um, whereas we're, you know, growing amidst a, um, um, an environment in the schools, as you personally know, 
is not very conducive to extracurricular activities and rewarding teachers for involvement in those. We know about the problems you're facing. Um, so that's why we chose that, and we chose it also because we thought we were hitting um, you know, an age group where we could be most, um, most useful you know, in, in training them on these, on these concepts. We've thought about doing a you know, Euro challenge for older students, what's the next step? Um, maybe, maybe it's an EU green challenge, it's an, an EU environment challenge, or an energy challenge, or something like that. That's certainly something that we could think about in the future. I hope my colleague Sandy Allman is listening. I mean, because I do economics, I sort of stay in my one area here, and this is, we're, we're sort of growing the program and strengthening it. But I think that it could evolve in time, and maybe even to un the undergraduate level in colleges, too. So, but don't be discouraged if it's you know ninth and tenth graders, and and if you're thinking, oh gosh, the ninth and tenth graders that I have, they wouldn't be capable of doing something like this. Think again, because we have a lot of teachers who thought that before, and were amazed at the potential that their their own ninth and tenth graders were able to reach. And if you want me to put you in touch on the phone with one of those teachers, I would be more than happy to do that because I know that hearing it from your peers is um, is is. Is special. I mean, it's 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 worthwhile doing that. There are also testimonies of teachers here up on the website that I encourage you to hear as well, and to, to go on and listen to. So with that, I think I will. If there are any more questions, other about the Euro Challenge, I'm going to go ahead and try to in very little time, and I'm even going to take my watch off because I don't want to go over and into uh, Professor Sedaro's time and uh, I have a long presentation but I'm going to try to to get through most of these points please feel free to interrupt me and ask questions along the way my what I'm going to attempt to do here is sort of a few things we're going to go from Europe to the euro so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the key concepts for understanding how the euro area functions what the euro area is a little bit of how it evolved but but mainly what it what it sort of means as a basis for understanding the European debt crisis, the the issues that the that um, many of the um, euro area countries and the euro area as a whole are facing. If you don't understand the term that I'm talking about, euro area, just wait a couple minutes because I do explain that as well. Um, and then I'm going to talk about the policy responses. And Professor Staro is going to take off where I leave off and what I can't cover, um, what Europe is doing to end that crisis right now. And as I said before, just for all of you who've been a little bit interested or intrigued by this idea of the Euro Challenge, this is the kind of presentation that we do. It's a little bit of a higher level for, for you, the teachers. We kind of bring it down and break it down and go into more of, uh, of an explanation of the basic concepts for the students. But this is the type of presentation, and many of these presentations are up on the website, as I, as I said before. Um, and uh, you'll see that when we ask students in the Euro Challenge to pick one of ten economic challenges, even though the, the, the main problem facing Europe might on the face of it be deficits and debt, right, the fiscal issues, okay? A lot of that problem is um, based on underlying problems in these economies, such as low growth, um, dealing with the, the, the burst of a housing bubble, you know, in the case of, say, Ireland, uh, weaknesses in the banking system, you know, such, such things as this. And, um, or openness to globalization and the problems and advantages that that can, that can, um, that that entails. Okay, so we're going to follow this in the presentation. From Europe to the Euro. I know that you heard this morning sort of about the evolution of the European Union. Um, there were two strands of European integration. One, the deepening of European integration at the same time, the widening of the European Union, the enlargement that you just heard about from Dan Hamilton. I'm going to take a very small segment of, of this modern EU history and start with um, something called the Single European Act, which set about the objectives of establishing an internal market. Those four freedoms. Were, was one of your speakers this morning, Sylvia, maybe talking about the, the, the EU single market, so the four freedoms of movement? goods, capital, services, and people. The euro was essentially thought of as the next step in the single market. So um, if you have all this free movement of goods and basically you know, um, freedom to do business and as a consumer to, to, to purchase products throughout this 
what is now the 500 million um, people person market, okay, if you have different currencies in there, that's still a barrier to business and trade and movement, correct? Imagine uh, you're all from D.C., Maryland, and Virginia are all represented here, right? Same thing as if we said, okay, what if you had to, if you were coming from Virginia today, pay, you know, come across a border, um, you didn't have to do that, but if you had to exchange a currency, you know, or if you had to have um, D.C. coins, D.C. Uh, dollars in your pocket to spend over here to pay for your parking or whatever. Um, it, 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 it's an, efficiency, an inefficiency that is built into any system that has different currencies. And so the idea was that this would be the next step. So uh, it was long in coming because this was even an idea that the founding fathers in Europe and, uh, in the 1950s and then through the, throughout the 1960s was um, an idea that was out there and didn't get re um, realized until the Maastricht Treaty in 1992, which set out um, how to achieve economic and monetary union, what we call EMU, and lays down the convergence criteria, how a country um, manages to or qualifies to have the euro. And I'll go through those criteria in a second. So the euro was introduced then in 1999 as a unit of account, and then the notes and coins were, were minted and um, printed and they went into circulation in 2002. So that's sort of the evolution there. So of the 27 EU members today, yeah, you can't hear me so well? Okay, of the, e of the 27 EU member countries, there are 17 that are members of the Euro area. That means they have the Euro. So the Euro area being that collective mass of 17 countries that share the common currency, the Euro. And what about the other 11? <coughs> Sorry, the other 10. That's a mistake. Um, 27 minus 17. Um, Denmark and the UK opted out. They negotiated an opt-out in the, in the Maastricht Treaty, which means that they are never obliged legally to adopt the euro, which is a very interesting distinction. But the other countries, most of them um, late you know, joiners, new members of the EU relatively, 2004 and 2007 enlargements, um, will adopt the euro per the treaty at some point when they are ready, okay, and when they choose also politically to do so. Sweden is also in that category and it has chosen um, on the basis of a referendum not to join the euro yet. So I just want to go over um, for two minutes about what distinguishes a country, you know, why would a country want to join t the euro area, why would it want to have the euro versus just having that single market that I talked about, okay, no borders between countries, free movement of, of, of goods, services, and of people. So the benefits of the single market are, like I said, increased competition from a consumer's perspective, lower prices, wider choice of, of products and services, more jobs, easier travel, more opportunities to live, work, and study in the EU. So you can go as a student and study and work in any EU country if you're a member of the EU. What does the euro then give you in addition to that? Well, things like price stability and security of purchasing power, low inflation ensured by the monetary policy of the European Central Bank, the elimination of transaction costs that I just talked about when you have to go and, and change your currencies. And this is at a personal level, but also at a business level. If you're doing a business transaction with another company in a different currency, there's an exchange rate risk that is associated with that. So the elimination of that. Price, price transparency, which should lead to greater competition and even lower prices if consumers can see that, oh, that same car that's priced in euros, so I can see the difference, is 100 euros cheaper over the border, and I live close to the border, and so I'm going to go and buy it over there, um, as opposed to from, you know, the guy who makes it in my country or sells it in my country. So what do countries then give up? Because this sounds like a pretty good deal, right? You're ad getting added benefits in addition to the single market. They give up the ability to change their own interest rates because they've given the ability, the, the, the power of setting monetary policy, setting interest rates up to the European Central Bank. And they also can't change their exchange rates, which means they can't do things like devalue their currencies. You want to think of a country that 
was sort of a serial devalu devaluer. Whenever it sort of lost competitiveness in the economy, the economy was slow, they decided, well, we're just going to devalue our currency. <coughs> Who did that in the post-war period, pre-Euro? Italy a lot, mm -hmm. France a couple times sure. at least, right? Um, Germany mainly no, because they were the most, the, the competitive standard. But, um, but that is no longer possible for those countries that belong to the euro. And that's been a criticism, too, of, of, of the euro and of the euro area um, by some people who have been critical about the situation of Greece. Greece hasn't been able to you know, devalue its currency to get out of its problems theoretically. I'll explain a little bit later why that, why that actually doesn't solve their problems. But this is something that countries give up when they join a monetary union. So they can't have an independent monetary policy. These are the cri convergence criteria. Um, I'm not going to really go into this because I want to get through a lot of the slides and talk about the current situation. But, um, but basically, countries had to get to a certain economic standard, low inflation, already low interest rates, fiscal discipline, so low um, deficit and debt levels, and exchange rate stability. So they had to peg their currency almost within a, um, a, a narrow band to the euro in order to sort of, it's like a, a training ground, like a fitness station um, before actually joining the euro. One of the problems was that a lot of countries, for a lot of countries, this was a difficult process. Even sort of some of the 11 countries and then Greece being the 12th in 2000 that, that joined the euro in the first round. Many of them had to do a lot in terms of fiscal discipline spending cuts, tax increases to make these criteria. And then after that, there was a little bit of, uh, let's say, Maastricht fatigue, reform fatigue. They got tired of pulling in their belts so much. And this is something that then happened, um, was revealed in the, in, the, in the first decade of the euro, that some countries were tired of, of you know, being good players, the good players that they had to be to get in. And then they sort of you know, loosen up their own rules uh, during the first uh, decade of the euro, and that led to some problems that are, um, have recently become very apparent. These are the countries that are members of the euro area that have the euro. This is another map. Any questions so far? Feel free to interrupt me if anything's not clear or I'm going too fast. And this is another one of the basics that I, I talked about, the European Central Bank. Um, very similar in nature to the Federal Reserve System, but different in, in, in some ways. For instance, the ECB has a single mandate, which is to maintain, to ensure price stability or low inflation, whereas the Fed has a dual mandate, which is not only low inflation, stable prices, but also full employment. So the construction of the euro area is very interesting and, and, and different from the United States in this way. There is a single monetary policy that's led by the European Central Bank. That picture is actually going to change on Tuesday because the European Central Bank is getting a new president. His name is Mario Draghi, the former governor of the Bank of Italy, so the, the head of the, 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 the Central Bank of Italy, is going to replace this man, Jean-Claude Trichet, who's been in the position for eight years and looking quite tired, I must say. Much, much more tired these days than that picture shows. Um, he's, had, he's had a lot to do lately. Um, so, uh, but he will be missed, um, but he has a, a good successor coming in after him. But that's uh, one person, one face you can put to monetary policy, just like you can put Ben Bernanke's face to the monetary policy of the United States. Over here, you know, for the United States, you might put uh, Tim Geithner's picture. One guy, Treasury, in charge of fiscal policy, basically, okay? So you have the people in Congress, too. It's not that simple, okay? But over here in Europe, you have quite a lot of people making decisions about, mon about fiscal policy. Fiscal policy, setting tax rates, um, making social policy decisions about social programs and uh, government outlays for social programs, et cetera, et cetera. These are all made at the national level. So those 17 leaders have sovereignty over their fiscal policy. They have not given up sovereignty in, 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 that, in that area. Although, when the treaty was set out, the Maastricht Treaty of Economic and Monetary Union, there were rules set out 
by which countries agreed to conduct their fiscal policies, their economic, their broader economic policies, with um, the the whole of the euro area in mind, so that they wouldn't be um, going out and spending lots and lots of money beyond sort of the master criteria they needed to 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 stay in shape, so that the economies would be similar, and the monetary union would function. This has been a bit of a weakness, this E, this economic union, the E in EMU has been weaker than desired. And so if you don't understand exactly that, think about it, and hopefully the slides that come up here will, will, um, will describe this a little bit more in detail. So this model, we asked this question, has this model worked well in this crisis? I think it's a bit of a rhetorical question. <laughs> It's important to realize that, um, you know, in its first decade, the euro was very successful. Um, it looked uh, from the outside to be extremely successful. The euro took on a larger role in international, as an international currency, as a reserve currency. Um, government debt was already on a clear downward path. Unemployment was coming down, um, as you know, among all of the all of the countries on average. Um, <laughs> The ECB was very successful in de delivering low inflation during that period, and the euro's introduction spurred even more trade beyond the single market among those countries that had the euro and investment. Um, so it, it, it did um, deliver economic advantages. The euro also, and this is very important, emerged as a symbol of European integration. So it was some... Um, we can't, I think, overstate the fact of how important it is that set in 17 of these countries, all of the, those citizens had a symbol of European integration in their pocket and used it every day. So just culturally, um, in terms of the, of the symbol of European integration, this is very important. And um, some of these peripheral countries, and I'll talk about that definition in a little while, um, experienced very strong growth. So countries that were catching up, Ireland, Spain, um, to a certain degree, Greece also had strong growth rates, and that was seen as a very, success, a very successful. Ireland, Celtic Tiger, that was looked on as, as, as a positive um, symbol or sign that, that the euro was working. Now, unfortunately, a lot of what was happening in that first decade of the euro masked some vulnerabilities that <laughs> existed and then were exposed in relief when the financial and economic crisis in 2008 hit. And those kinds of vulnerabilities involved the excessive borrowing in many countries. You know, interest rates throughout the globe were extremely low, not only in, in, in the euro area, and this allowed countries like Greece, Portugal, Ireland to borrow too much money. Uh, we in this country also borrowed too much money. Um, but they borrowed too much money both as, as a state and as individuals, so private and public debt all rose. And growth in some countries was, was unsustainable, so you have property bubbles in countries like Ireland and Spain. Mm -hmm. Large imbalances where public sector wages but also private sector wages got way out of sync with productivity growth, and so countries, many of them, not all of them in the Euro area, lost competitiveness. There were financial, financial sector vulnerabilities in many countries, so the banks, banking systems were, were weak in some of the countries, not all of them. And the fiscal framework was not strong enough. I think Michael is going to talk a little bit more about that, about how some countries went off, um, off the rails. But there was a fiscal framework. It was called the Stability and Growth Pact, designed to keep governments from spending too much money, essentially, from going too far out of line on the fiscal side, and those rules were not adhered to. They were not set up um, well enough with hindsight, um, in hindsight, that, that they could be enforced, and they were not enforced by the member states, and even by some of the stronger fiscal member states like Germany and France. And there became this uh, divergence also between the core and periphery countries. I'll show you a picture in a moment what I mean by that. But you had stronger economic countries and stronger fiscal countries, more fiscally, say, responsible countries like Germany, diverge from countries like Greece, Portugal. And that was not the idea. You know, the, the founding fathers, let's say, of EMU, when they set it up, they thought that things would happen the other way. They thought that if you had this monetary union, the, the economic circumstances, the economic, basically the, 
the indicators, you know, inflation, unemployment, all these important things, growth, they would converge. The countries would, would tend to look like each other because they were in the same system. And then the monetary union would be successful because it's very easy to conduct a monetary policy where all the countries are performing at basically the same rate. But unfortunately, we had this before that convergence could really take place. We had this global economic crisis hit at a very, you know, unfortunate time, revealing all of these things that had not yet been finished in the construction of of EMU. Does that make sense, everybody? Okay. So here we have a very interesting picture. I think it shows. Um, this handshake, this reluctant handshake between the German Chancellor Angela Merkel and um, the, uh, the Greek Prime Minister Papandreou, and it's a very uncomfortable relationship. I mean, Greece does not want to be going to its stronger Euro area members asking for hat, you know, with, with hat in hand asking for, for a bailout. That's not a comfortable position to be in, nor is it a comfortable position for Angela Merkel and other stronger countries with, with, with more money. To, um, to be in a position of, of, of giving you know, Greece that money. It's not as simple as giving it money. I mean, these are guarantees, but uh, we can talk about that a little bit. But it's still the same sort of principle. Um, so you sort of have this not only an economic different, differentiation and divergence rather than convergence between what we'll call the core and periphery, but a political one as well, which is quite you know, damaging or can be quite damaging. So let's um, look for a second at the at the crisis and 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 how it's being being solved for a few minutes. Um, some of the American commentators in the last few months, I've I've been um, surprised at at kind of the the impression that they leave that Europe kind of landed and made its own crisis, um, rather than this situation that Europe is being in this this crisis a continuation of a larger sort of mini-phased crisis that started actually in the United States, one could argue, with the burst of our housing bubble and the collapse of Lehman Brothers in 2008. We could argue about this, it'd be nice to, because you may have a different opinion than I do, but I don't think that you could dispute the fact that if there's anything we draw, any lesson we draw from this, the economic situation over the last years, last four years, it is that we are intricately connected, Europe and the U.S. in particular, but the global economy as a whole. But the transatlantic economic link, and I think Professor Sodaro is going to talk about this a little bit, is undisputed and it's very strong. And this is why we're kind of having this back and forth thing um, of, of, of bad economic situations that are drawing each other, each other down. Okay? So I just want to show you this in a picture. We had, let's, let's say it begins with the subprime crisis in the United States. Again, it, there was a really a global credit bubble um, with, uh, as I mentioned before, low interest rates throughout the world and in Europe too. Um, and I mentioned the problems that that, that caused also in Europe. Um, and you had a lot of European banks, you know, investing in mortgage-backed securities and being part of that problem. But of course, it burst here first and you had, you know, Lehman Brothers happen, a financial crisis that, that ostensibly really sparked um, in the United States, led to, you know, fed quickly to Europe and then into an economic crisis in 2009 where global trade fell off uh, the cliff, basically, um, and the economy suffered. I think global growth was, I don't even know, I think it was 2%, uh, whereas a, a, a standard, it, and that takes into account all the very fast-growing uh, emerging market economies, the advanced economies were um, contracting at a rate in this country of, of something like 4% of, uh, and, four, and over 4% in, in Europe, in the European Union. You had a policy response to the crisis, which was very effective and very necessary, of course, but it had some consequences. So you had massive stimulus, not only by central banks um, pumping liquidity into the system and reducing interest rates to historical lows, but also stimulus policies where money was pumped into the economy in various forms, not only in the United States, but also in Europe. These were effective to a certain degree, but one of the consequences was that um, there was a surge in government debt levels. I'll show you a chart um, on the next page. Is everything clear so far? Are you following me pretty well? Okay. And, and that surge in government debt 
drew focus to, drew the market's focus to some of the most vulnerable countries, and in particular, some European countries, some Euro area countries. Not only, but, but this is where the rubber hit the road, really, for Europe. Greece, Ireland, and Portugal. And the response to that, the European response to that, was um, to develop programs uh, jointly with the IMF to provide assistance to these countries to get out of that debt crisis. I'll go into this a little more detail. But then this led into financial stresses within Europe so that markets thought, oh gee, you know, now Europe is not being able to solve, at least not quickly, the problems in Greece. So the, all of the European banks with exposure to debt in Greece who've bought Greek bonds, we no longer see as being as viable as before. And if they go under, then that, of course, will bring up the debt levels of their sovereigns, of the countries that, uh, that, that belong to them. And so uh, a bit of a vicious circle between uh, a feedback loop, we call it in, in, in economic speak, between the country debt, the public debt of these countries, and the um, solvency, liquidity and solvency of their banking, of their banks, came into to being and came into focus of the, of the financial markets. So you had this, and then of course, when, when this development started to appear, the United States, that's when the United States started getting really interested, especially interested in what was happening in Europe, because it was no longer to them a homegrown threat, just to Europe and, and the Euro, which would have been bad enough already, but because the financial linkages between US and Europe are so um, tight and also opaque, like we don't exactly know how much exposure U.S. banks would have in the form of money market funds, credit default swaps if those were to kick in, all these very fancy financial instruments, it became a threat to the U.S. economy. And you see more and more headlines in the United States about how our economy was being affected by Europe. Our recovery wasn't get going, getting off the ground because of Europe. And so here's the question mark, you know, if Europe can't get a handle on this, so it goes, let's say, then we may have, you know, a, a recirculation recir back into a global financial and economic crisis. The positive news about this is that Europe has taken some major steps this week to contain the crisis, and I want to explain those and explain them in the way that they fit into this EMU model and the problems with it that I explained before. So Europe is getting to, not only to the, um, it's not only putting out its fires, it's really getting to the causes of why it was so vulnerable in, in this situation. Okay? So again, these were some of the measures that Europe in particular did when the economic and, crisis and financial crisis of 2008-2009 hit, and the bottom line is these interventions were successful in preventing an even greater economic decline, very parallel to what you could say about the United States, but caused public debt levels to, to rise sharply with all the inherent you know, consequences of that. Here's a graph that's maybe interesting um, to you. It shows... Um, and I can, we can send this around or, or make, you know, send you uh, copies of this, um, of the presentation if you like, or put it up on the website. Um, this is debt to GDP levels. Their change from 2007, which is in gray, so pre-crisis, to 2011, so you see the magnitude of the increase in public debt over that time period. And, um, and the one on the, the right I just did in red to, to see the United States, these actually are figures that aren't normally published by the United States. The U.S. publishes lower figures that are just um, federal debt held by the public. This is a measure published by the IMF. It's a comparable measure of gross debt, so includes state and local government debt in it. That's why it's higher than some of the measures that you might be used to hearing. So there are actually only three European or Euro area countries that are higher, that have higher debt to GDP levels than, than the United States. So just a little factoid to put it into perspective here. Um, but 
Europe doesn't have the dollar, which affords the United States the ability to run higher debt levels and deficit levels. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, these are the this is this is the funny um, two uh, two letter abbreviations. So A T is Austria, B E is Belgium, C Y Cyprus, E E Estonia. These are all again the seventeen countries that have the euro. F I is Finland, F R is France, D E Deutschland, Germany. They're on the basis of the um, the, the in the languages of those countries. Sorry. Oh, okay, okay, great. I E so the, with the ones with the high levels, E L is Greece, I E is Ireland, I T is Italy, P T is Portugal. So you have like the four, you know, you have the three program countries plus Italy, which is which is in you know under under pressure now, um, up at the top of the charts. Hmm. Italy just seems a lot better off. Yeah, it's under market pressure now, but that's partly because it didn't have. The increase in Italy, like Italy's always had a very large debt to GDP level. Even when it came into the euro, it had much higher than the oh, master okay. criteria so of 60%. Increase, not, not so the increase, yeah, I think okay. so. I mean, the, the market attention was really drawn to the fact of, yeah. wow, it's so much bigger now. So you look at Greece, you know, you look at Ireland, yeah, my well, goodness. So that wasn't, I was thinking, yeah. I was Italy. Uh, right. Yeah. But, but yeah. It, and, and Italian debt, a lot of it is held, held by citizens, is held privately within the country. It's not foreign debt. So that also makes a bit of a difference. Um, and uh, but but Italy is 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 also through this this um, sort of contagion to the financial sector, but also on the basis of its very low growth projections, um, under market pressure in terms of interest rate spreads. Now I'll explain that in a second, um, because that's sort of the next biggest case, and that's why this crisis it's so it's so important for Europe to get a handle on this, and why it it, it went to the very. You know, it took the very bold measures that it did last week is because if a country like Italy were to be in danger of defaulting, that's a lot of debt. Greece, Portugal, Ireland, you know, you can develop a program to save them, but if Italy and Spain come under pressure, then that's a big, a, a big chunk to, to, to eat. Yes. Okay time yeah, ask. sure. Mm -hmm. I'm interested looking looking at this graph. We see FR France, yes, and then it's PT Portugal. Mm -hmm. They look like their debt levels are approximately the same. Why aren't we worried about France? Well, actually, they are worried about France, but through the banking <laughs> through the banking system. So you know uh, that I think it's Societe Generale, one of the big French banks, was downgraded. There's a threat that the rating agencies will downgrade French, you know. French sovereign debt, which is a big deal. You know, we had that happen by one of the rating agencies, Standard & Poor's, to the United States during the debt, you know, ceiling debacle this summer. Um, so they're not out of the woods, but France is, France is a country with, I mean, it, it's a country with a solid political system, stability, whereas you might argue that Italy is a bit erratic, <laughs> or at least its prime minister. Um, <laughs> I remember I, I studied in Italy on my first year of my master's um, uh, program, and there was a course, and in the main book for this course, the title of the book was Eporsi Muove, which means, but it still works. <laughs> it still moves, right? Like, despite all of the problems. Well, you know, sometimes things, yeah, happen. And so that's one basis, sort of the, 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 the political stability and the, uh, the market perception of whether the state, the institutions, the political institutions have the capacity to solve their problems. And also growth rates. France has much higher growth rates than the Italian rates of growth now and, and a more competitive society more I mean more com more competitive economy sorry more competitive economy so when you look at the things that each country has to sell um, you know it's it's importance in global trade uh, those sorts of things Versus factors market, exactly market. yeah that too right Thank you. does that make sense yes. it's kind of ba basic I don't you know I, I could be more uh, give you a more like a five minute answer but I think the the, the basics are, are okay, yeah. But it's interesting, and this brings up, I mean, when you look at this, you see how diverse the countries are within the euro area, and just on this measure, but if you looked at all other economic measures, and lots of other me measures as well outside of economics, you would see that, you know, we're dealing with 17 very different 
countries, very different economies, and that's why, you know, this thought that they would all converge and make the monetary union, you know, unproblematic was probably, you know, wishful thinking in hindsight, and particularly now we're having a, a period of, of that the crisis itself has promoted more divergence, and that, that will make things difficult going forward. But as I'm going to say later on, there is um, a, an underlying and a very fundamental and crucial commitment of these countries and of the countries of all of the European Union to the euro and to Europe and to making it work. So despite all these problems, that's the underlying line, and I think that's where you've that's, – that's the source of the solutions and the um, – the uh, measures to address the problem that you saw leaders take this week. Do I need to get into bond spreads at all? I think, you know, this is kind of how we explain, especially to the students if they need to know for our Euro challenge, what a bond spread is. But I think I'm just going to show you this chart and, 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 sh and make a comment about market pressure. Um, there wasn't any market pressure during the first 10 years of EMU for these countries that are now in trouble to do the right thing because the market did not distinguish between the risk, what they call risk premia, the risk that a country like Greece or Portugal would not, would not be able to make good on the money it borrowed and the risk associated with a country like France or Germany not being able to make good on its debts. Does that make sense? That, that concept is measured in what we call spreads, okay? So you see these spreads were very different. These are spreads between the German 10-year government bond and others, and I, we've only measured it for sort of the, um, the problem countries here. But uh, they were wide leading up to the euro, before EMU and the euro, and then began to converge and were next to nothing, okay? A very, very small differential, a very small risk premium that the markets were putting on buying debt of Greece, Portugal, Ireland, some of these peripheral countries, and the core countries, Europe. Everyone thought that's a really good thing, but of course these very low interest rates allowed those countries then to borrow more and more and more and get into more difficulties. And now, you know, markets are making such a distinction that you could even argue that maybe they were under-assessing risk and now over-assessing risk yeah. in the aftermath of the crisis. That is all I want you to get from that chart. And I'm a terrible economist, you know, using too many charts. But, it, you know, sometimes a picture says a thousand words, and this is a very interesting, interesting picture, I think, because had the markets had a more, you know, globally also, but in the run-up to this crisis, for Europe in particular, uh, a more sort of um, taken some of these divergences, these real divergences, into account and priced them in, then we would have had more market pressure. Um, where institutional pressure had been a little bit lax, we would have at least had more market pressure to make these countries do the right thing. Now we've got a whole lot of both, and it's difficult, but at least, you know, they're, they're, they're going in the right direction, and maybe it's too much on the, by the markets now. Hmm? Yeah. Forgiveness, does that blue line now come down? Yeah, probably. Yeah. And these are a bit out to date, too. I mean, every day, you could, you know, go crazy from the ping pong game, but it's the basic. Um, but yes, I think spreads have come down, and, uh, and they will probably continue to do so. But it's all, um, I mean, this is the key. You know, have the European leaders done enough? Are the solutions um, credible enough? Uh, and their details, which will come out in the next month or so, um, do they ensure that um, that markets will be able to 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 come off of these uh, of these rather you know of, of all this insecurity and volatility too? I mean, the volatility itself, the ups and downs, is, is hurtful too. If we just look for a second, and I, I only have a few more minutes, so I'm going to try to just um, go through this. I think. Um, Professor said I was going to talk a little bit about where the Greek problems came from, so I won't dwell on this. But they're very different than the problems of, say, Ireland or or or, or Portugal. Um, so, but similar in, in in some ways. But 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 not every country. I mean, you see that the different countries had different different problems, and and the source of their problems is is different. 
So you had in Greece this um, excessive wage growth, particularly in the public sector, and a lot of spending on, on social problems in excess of what the country could eventually now pay for. Um, poor fiscal discipline and very, very weak institutions. You talk, you, I think you hear about the tax collection agency in Greece, which basically doesn't function, so people pay no taxes, and that's kind of a problem that needs to be fixed. Um, very large revisions to budgetary statistics, so even um, when Greece entered the euro area in 2000, um, many people in hindsight say, well, that probably shouldn't have happened because later on it was found out that their statistics were all, were all falsified, bad, whatever, badly constructed. So problems do there. Do know this? You know, that's a good question. I mean, all these smart people in the EU and then, oh, yeah, whatever Greece says, it's unbelievable. Yeah, you know, um, that's a tough question. I have to be diplomatic in my answer, but um, <laughs> I, I see your point. I see, I see your point. I, I really do. Um, you know, a lot of it was not, was, was not revealed by the Greek authorities, and they thought, you know, whatever. Um, a lot of sort of the, um, a whole kind of quadrant of, of, um, of uh, debts owed by the military or something, something having to do with military, the situation, the fiscal situation of the military, which was very, you know, for obvious reasons, well concealed and quite opaque. But yeah, I mean, they should have had the right numbers and, and they should have known. A lot of warnings were given and not heeded, of course. And um, Professor Sadaro will talk a little bit more about this, I think, about why the fiscal rules were not adhered to. Yeah. Um, but, but there are other problems in, in several different countries, too. So I mentioned in Italy you have a problem of slow growth. You have a problem of housing bubbles in Italy and in Ireland and Spain. You have weak uh, banking institutions uh, in Ireland, but also you know, France and, and, and Germany as well that are coming, you know, coming into focus uh, of the markets now. You have long-term issues like, like population aging, which obviously affects, affects growth and, and projections of, of, of long-term growth. So population aging is no longer like a long-term problem. It's, it's, it's really a problem of today. And population aging, but also low, low birth rates are weighing on, on growth prospects and growth. Um, so these are some of the challenges that we look at and we ask students to choose from in the Euro Challenge too. As I said, this is how they're related to, to the bigger picture. Um, so Europe had to respond. Here on the right-hand side, I have all those institutions that you learned about this morning involved in this, so the European Central Bank, but obviously the, the member states uh, in the institution of the Council, uh, which did meet um, on, on Wednesday of this week and Sunday before, too. The um, Commission and the European Parliament, and also the, European, the International Monetary Fund, which is involved jointly with the EU on these, on these programs for the troubled countries. I'm not really going to go into depth on this. I think I should talk a little bit about um, what was decided and, and sort of this five-pronged approach to solving the crisis. I think Professor Zadar was going to talk specifically about what was decided, but it's interesting. I think it's important to see that there, it's a broader plan here, that it's not just about Greece. It's wider than that, and uh, it involves of course, Greece and solving Greece's problem and getting it on a sustainable um, debt trajectory. So there's a second program that was agreed this week, a second program of, of 100 billion euros that will be used as a guarantee for Greek debt, and a private sector involvement. So the private sector banks have agreed to what's called a haircut, a write down of the debt that they own, the Greek debt that they own, in order to alleviate that burden for Greece. Mm -hmm. Question. It seems like all of the Western u newspapers uh, put Honor Merkel out there as the one who brokered this deal. What does that do to the stability of all the other countries? If you're uh, read the European Union, if you're readily admitting that Germany really is the power broker and that the, she says you're to come in line, or at least that's my interpretation of what or they else. wrote, or else is more or less is how they played that. Mm -hmm in this camaraderie of we're all in this together. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's very, 
the way the press interprets these things and, and, and puts it out there to the general public is always exaggerated, right? But yes, I mean, Angela Merkel and, and her French counterpart, Nicolas Sarkozy, played a huge role in this. And it's not, it's not by accident. I mean, this is something that's been happening since, since the end of the Second World War, as you heard you know, today. This is historical. These are the largest countries. They happen to be the most economically powerful countries. Germany, a very ec economically successful country that's come out of this crisis. Um, uh, with a proven economic model, export-led model, which has its flaws, but at least looks very good at this time. Um, and so by nature of all of that, the historical reasons, the size reasons, the geographical reasons, the, the economic region, reasons today, you have them exerting a larger role. Um, and when Germany and France agree, uh, just on the basis of their you know, the, their proportion of, of votes within the EU, uh, things get done. When they don't agree, things don't get done. But that's the first part of my, my answer. The second part is they still need to convince their colleagues because in issues like this, where it involves money, there's a principle called unanimity, which means that even tiny Slovakia can agree and in, two, in three weeks ago we were in this situation where Slova the Slovakian parliament, the government fell, Slovakian parliament did not agree to the changes in the European financial stability facility and they needed that to be able to go ahead, to be able to go ahead with this summit, to agree on the next stage of changes and to get to the table to help um, and they didn't have that and, and, and they didn't have it you know, right away, and, and then the articles were all about how tiny little Slovakia could slow the EU down. So it's, it, exactly, it's, it's part of both. So today the story is different than it was two weeks ago. Um, but, but lots of times, you know, the, um, the smaller countries in the EU, they look to the European Commission to help them further their views. Um, many of these smaller countries are also have also been more fiscally responsible. They also didn't flout the fiscal rules like Germany and France did in the mid 2000s, um, which arguably didn't, you know, I mean, it didn't help this problem and, and arguably contributed to it. So, um, so you, you know, you have you have a lot of interesting relationships between the larger and uh, and smaller countries as well as the periphery and and core. The second element of this strategy is to, 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 to say Greece is unique, okay? This is not what all the countries, all the other countries don't have the same problems and we're not, and the, con, and, and, and the situation is not going to catch, you know, the cold is not going to be caught by all these, other, by, by all these kind of other countries. They wanted to put up a firewall, particularly ahead of Italy and, and France. And this involves leveraging the funds that are available in the EFSF, this uh, facility, this fund, the European Financial Stability Facility, what Slovakia agreed to. Now how to leverage that with other forms of investment, um, and that gets complicated, I won't get into it, um, in order to say to the markets, hey, if anything does happen, you guys start picking at France and Italy, then we have enough money to support them, so don't, <laughs> basically, is what they're trying to say. Build a firewall to prevent contagion. And then the banks, so to a plan to recapitalize the banks so that they are fit to take the inevitable losses that may, that may come by this, uh, in, in the situation of, of Greece, and, and also to convince markets that banks are not in uh, liquidity and solvency uh, threat, under a threat. And another dimension is the growth dimension, okay? At the same time as we're focused here on austerity, on fiscal contraction, on getting finances into order and bringing those huge debt levels down, we need to focus on growth because guess what? In the, in the equation of debt to GDP ratio, the denominator is growth, right? Your GDP growth. So if you don't grow, you have a debt problem that you can't solve over time, okay? And so what are they doing about that? There have been plans in place for a long time, and crises sometimes help countries, force countries to do the work, the improvements, the reforms that they should have been doing all along. And you see this over the last 18 months, reforms to pension systems to make sure that they are sustainable, 
economically, financially. Reforms to labor markets, product markets, implementation of single market legislation. It's happening more uh, it's at, at an accelerated rate that these countries are adopting the reforms that will help them, their economies be strong in the future. They're not exactly politically um, pleasant or unpainful socially. They are very socially painful, but they're necessary in order to ensure that the countries grow and don't and can get out of this debt trap. And governance. I talked about the institutions, and I think that Michael is going to talk about this a bit too, the strengthening of the fiscal rules and the institutions that govern the euro, strengthening those so that everyone plays by the right rules. And in fact, we're, we're going down the road towards uh, greater fiscal integration, more E in EMU. And this is my last slide. So this is the, the puzzle, okay, where, where the missing E or, or the little E is becoming a big E. I've seen it different ways. And these are kind of all of the, the strategies involved in this. So it's, it's much more broad than just cutting budgets. It's much bigger than that. The problems are much are diverse and large going into this. And so the solutions must also be broad. They must be far-reaching. They're broad for, uh, and they're big and bold for the countries that have to take them on, and they're big and bold for the institutions and for the other Euro area countries. It's not an easy time for Europe right now, but seeing the leaders come together and agree to some of these measures this week, which were quite far-reaching, um, made us all quite positive about the future, that Europe, at the end of the day, can come out stronger and more integrated, in particular fiscally integrated, than before. So I'm going to end it there. And anybody have lingering questions, thoughts? Was that? Go ahead. This morning, I, I read this morning that uh, part of the deal over here was that the EU would potentially borrow something like uh, 70 billion uh, euros that they pulled out of China. And they were working on uh, that. Uh, can you comment on, you know, what are some of the uh, implications of that? Yeah, there are very interesting implications. I think Professor Zadaro might, might have some thoughts on this as well. But, uh, yeah, it's no secret that uh, the, uh, the president of the European Financial Stability Facility took a trip to China um, this past week uh, and, and to some other countries with large sovereign wealth funds, basically with money to spend and, and excessive reserves to, to lend to see if they would be interested in, in, in helping to leverage this um, uh, this EFSF, this fund that the Europeans have. And um, I think that you shouldn't view it as sort of Europe selling out or the Chinese trying to buy up Europe or whatever. I mean, the Chinese won't be convinced to do this unless it is in their interest. They will see it as an investment opportunity and they will either choose to do it or not choose to do it. Um, there are, of course, you know, political ramifications to this. The more indebted Europe is to China in all sorts of ways, and the more, you know, with, with trade and other things involved with China it is, as the U.S. is, the more we're going to, you know, have to deal with each other and we're going to have frictions possibly in other areas. Um, so I don't think that there will be a quid pro quo where China says, well, okay, but, you know, change your Taiwan policy or, or something political. Um, um, for, for in exchange for this. I think the Chinese will simply see it as, as an investment opportunity. But it does, let's say, augment, change, whatever, alter the nature of the relationship a bit. And you can certainly draw some conclusions for that about, about, about what um, the nature of the relationship is. But they, there are close cooperation. There are, you know, with, with China, the EU has a, a, a dialogue with China similar to that with, with, that the U.S. has. So there is constant um, cooperation, but also tension on some of these issues. Um, I know we have the, U, the European focus on this. To what degree do you think that this is creating a, a new order, you know, with the global economy? I mean, how much of this are we looking at past methods and um, possibilities in terms of managing this crisis, or you know, or is it a whole new ball game because well, yeah. of the global economy? 
I mean, just just to look at the at how Europe is solving this this crisis. I mean, I think that um, it, it's a it's a new ball game within within Europe because there is no model of 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 regional integration like Europe in to the extent that that they have it in Europe in anywhere else in the world, and particularly the monetary union. You've had experiments in monetary you know, um, arrangements and things like that, the African Currency Union, I think, Central Africa, um, Mercosur, but I don't think that that's monetary at all. So it's really kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of flying into the unknown, right? There's no script for how this is working, how the, this written for, for how this works. The only model really is the United States of Europe, which incidentally took a while to form a currency union, right? The greenback came during the Civil War, and before that, we had all kinds of of crazy, you know, states issuing their own currencies and backed by silver, gold, whatever. Um, so that took a long time in making, and took a long time for the for the Fed, the, the federal, the system, uh, the uh, Federal Reserve system, to be developed and to be to win credibility. So it's interesting in looking at it's, it's interesting to look at that. But you you still have 27 sovereign nations as opposed to 50 not sovereign states. Um, and so it's a different animal. We're not going to get to a United States of Europe. That's, I think, not the end game. But it's something different. And like Dan was saying, that's the beauty of Europe. That's the interesting part of studying Europe for your students and for yourselves, I think, is that the end game is not written, neither for this monetary part or for the EU itself and where the borders are and, and, and the level of integration. And so it's um, so it's it's pretty fascinating, and the global dimension I think is is one that's part of that dynamism because that is also changing, the emergence of of, of countries like China, their importance in in the world. I mean, China, um, Germany was the largest ex exporter until last year when it was surpassed by China. This this affects everything. It's sort of like you know the background, uh, the changing background against all of these changes are happening. So it's, it, it's all shifting. I'll just take one more question because I want Professor Sadara to have enough time. Mm -hmm. The bank recapitalization, is there a timeline for that? Is there a process for where is that money going to come from and what are the implications? Yeah. I mean, the, the recapitalization, I can't remember exactly what the figure was. I think it's $106 billion. It Banks um, need to... Uh, recapitalize and uh, have and, and ha do that do that process. I mean, in, increase their capital uh, ratios by June 30th of next year. So they have about you know less than nine months to to get up to certain ratios. They can do that through the markets. So just taking on new capital um, from investors if they are viable enough to do so. If they have trouble doing that, then that's when member states, countries individually would support that recapitalization. And there is a European institution called the European Banking Authority, um, the EBA, and it is doing renewed stress tests of the banks, so under certain economic conditions and under um, the condition uh, of, of uh, you know, Greece not being able to, to pay its debts, so where Greek bonds have to be written down what is the impact on these banks and what capital then is needed. So some of these calculations have already been made, but there are new calculations that are going through now. And basically they're crunching some numbers and the banks will get that and say, okay, we need to earn this, we need to raise this much capital. How are we going to do that? And there's also money being put in directly from the member states so that the banks don't have to don't have to pull back lending so much that it has an adverse effect on the economy. They want to make sure that they're, they're shoring up the banking system, but not at the expense of economic growth and lending to companies and to people, you know, to buy houses and to spend and to, you know what I mean? So again, you need to avoid a vicious circle here. But that's essentially the plan. Um, the details will, will come out. Um, yeah, is that okay? Okay. Um, Michael, I really want you to, to come up and begin your presentation. If maybe we could talk outside. Thank you.